Here is our silicon lattice with positive charges available in the left hand part and negative charges available in the right. We will simplify the diagram further by omitting double bonds and show the available positive charges as white dots, making the available negative charges in the other part blue dots. Their parent atoms are no longer neutral. Those from which a positive charge has departed become negative. And those that have lost a negative charge must and do assume a positive charge. The atoms of the semiconductor material itself remain green. They form the fixed lattice through the space of which the electrical charges move. We can consider that they play little part in the basic electrical action. To simplify still further, let us remove them, but suggest their continued presence by a green background. Now imagine, for convenience of illustration, that the charged atoms are much more concentrated in each piece of silicon. And now, finally, let us bring the two pieces of silicon together so that they become, as it were, one piece. The charges that we have made available the little white and blue dots, are free to move and some by their random movements and eventually their own mutual attraction, like attracting unlike, collide and cancel each other, leaving behind their parent atoms. These two lines of atoms are the vital ones and we can temporarily ignore the others. These atoms carrying negative and positive charges respectively, and being unable to move, create an electric field. The existence of this boundary field is very important for it controls the flow of current. It tends to move negative charges in the direction of the blue arrows and positive charges in the direction of the red. Now, within the P and the N type pieces of silicon, holes and electrons are in fact always in random motion. But the direction of the field is such that it turns away any holes, remember these are positive, that approach from the P type side, and any electrons, these are negative, that approach from the N type side. If we connect a battery so that the p-type side is negative and the n-type side is positive, the field of the junction is strengthened and, of course, no current flows. However, if we take out the battery and put it in the other way around, the field of the junction is weakened. Some holes from the p-type can now flow into the n-type and electrons from the n-type flow into the p-type. Note the cancellations, called recombinations, between holes and electrons, and essential for current flow round the circuit. As the voltage increases, the field is further weakened, more recombinations take place, and the current flow increases. And so current flows in one direction, but not in the other. This is then a rectifier. And a most highly efficient rectifier. Current in the reverse direction is stopped within this extremely thin slice. And because it is so thin, it offers practically no resistance to current in the forward direction. It is this that makes semiconductor rectifiers so very efficient. This thin slice, mounted within this case, gives us devices rated at 200 amperes. And these, mounted on cooling fins not very much larger than themselves, go into racks like this. They show a considerable size advantage when compared to older types of rectifiers, such as, for example, the Mercury Arc. The three here handle the same amount of power as this compact unit of silicon rectifiers, 280 volts and 1,000 amperes. 
This size advantage and efficiency is of great importance where demands of space are paramount, such as in electric traction. Banks of such rectifiers are today used in multiple unit trains for local travel. And in the much larger locomotives for main line work, where they are rectifying nearly 3,000 amperes at about 1,000 volts. And today, germanium and silicon rectifiers are finding their way into all kinds of industry where tremendous quantities of direct current are required for such processes as tin plating, chlorine manufacture, or aluminium smelting. From thousands of amperes in rectifier banks to microamps in a transistor, a tiny device but one of great versatility. What is a transistor? Well, if we took our rectifier slice into which we diffused aluminium from this side and diffused in some more from this side, we should have made a transistor of sorts. For this device is nothing more than two junction rectifiers back to back. Thus we have a PNP transistor. Or, starting from P-type material, we could diffuse in, say, phosphorus from both sides and have an NPN transistor. Transistors thus have two junctions. Each will have its own boundary charges, and we can see what this will mean by our diagram. Here is our rectifier, a PN junction within a slice of silicon or germanium. Now by diffusing phosphorus atoms into the P-type side, we cancel the P-type properties so far in and change part of it to N-type. And so we create two PN junctions in a single slice. As before, the N-type material has electrons, negative charges, available. And the P-type material has holes, positive charges, available. For simplicity, we will not show their random motions and will omit the holes in the P-type material. But later indicate their presence by the recombinations which occur between them and electrons which may find themselves in the P-type material. If we now connect a battery to the right hand of PN junction with its polarity such that the field of the junction is weakened, then just as in the rectifier, electrons will move from the right hand N-type material into the P-type material. Recombinations will occur and current will flow around the right hand circuit. Let us now make a second circuit to include the complete NPN structure with a voltage across it which increases the field of the left hand PN junction. This field causes most of the electrons made available by the first circuit to move across the left hand junction and hence make a large current around this second circuit. So that now the small current in the first circuit, the result of the recombinations of electrons and holes, is effectively controlling a much larger current in the second or load circuit. As the voltage increases on the first junction, the number of electrons passing into the P-type is increased. In a good transistor, perhaps for every electron that flows in the control circuit, 99 will flow in the load circuit. A small current change in the first circuit thus produces a large current change in the second circuit. This is amplification. Reduce the current flowing in the first circuit. Increase it. Just the way a variable applied signal would. The transistor is thus an amplifying device. It will amplify and oscillate at radio and audio frequencies. Unlike the valve, it requires no filament heating nor high-tension batteries. It will operate on a few volts only. It is small, highly efficient, robust, and non-microphonic. 
Therefore, one of the first uses, and still a large one, is in place of valves, in portable radio sets, and death aids, like this. This death aid has its transistor amplifier, switch, controls, pickup microphone, all contained in the spectacle frame. Little loudspeaker pocket radios like this are now well known. They and deaf aids of this kind would be completely impossible without transistors. This battery operated portable tape recorder uses transistors. In fact, anything to do with sound amplification or radio that has to be portable requires the use of transistors. This radio microphone has its transistors, batteries, and everything contained in a case not much larger than a matchbox. It will transmit over several yards, and its signals are picked up on an aerial and receiver and amplified for transmission over radio, television, and public address networks. This is a radio transmitter so small that it can be swallowed. Inside a transistor, its battery, oscillatory circuit and aerial. It will go on transmitting from the digestive tract. This is a receiving aerial and this particular pill is sensitive to pressure. With pills like this, the doctors are doing valuable medical research. Pills sensitive to temperature, pressure and acidity have already been constructed. And this research team in a British hospital is building up a picture of the workings of the insides of patients, both well and ill. Messages are thus transmitted from parts of the body never before accessible, received and recorded for later study. By means of x-rays, the information is correlated with the position of the pill within the body. Transistors are thus opening up a completely new field of health research. And also of research on the human body when undergoing strenuous exertion. At an army research unit, they strap electrodes under a man's heart and on two other pressure points. To the ordinary laboratory equipment of detection is added a radio receiver. The tiny transmitter then transmits signals of the heartbeats over several hundred yards, enabling studies of a man's reactions to be made under conditions of violent exertion information which could not be gained in any other way. <laughs>